Good morning. We welcome you once again to the online worship service of Park Street Baptist Church. We are located in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. It's the Lord's Day, June 28, 2020. Andrew Harbridge is our Minister of Music. Sylvie Copland will be playing the children's song. Diane Richardson will be telling the children's story. Malcolm Copland is our Technical Director. He will also be our reader this morning. I'm David Richardson. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge Jesus, your only Son, as our Savior and King. As we battle against sin and darkness, we need this time of refreshing in your presence. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Park Street Baptist Church. We hope that you enjoy this morning's service, and let's begin by singing the first hymn, Onward, Christian Soldiers.
Our first scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 63, verses 1 to 8. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. I found this next hymn in the old Pentecostal hymnal. It's He Brought Me Out of the Miry Clay. I hope you enjoy this and are blessed by singing along. My heart was distressed beneath Jehovah's red ground, and lo, in the pit where my sins dragged me down, I cried to the Lord from the deep miry clay, who tenderly brought me out to golden day. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. Strong rock by his side, my steps were established, and here I'll abide. No danger of falling, where here I remain, but stand by his grace until the crown I gain. He brought me out of the miry clay, he set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul. Song of praise, hallelujah. He gave me a song, twas a new song of praise. By day and by night, these sweet notes I will raise. My heart's overflowing, I'm happy and free. I'll praise my Redeemer who has rescued me. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my His wonderful mercy to me. I'll praise Him till all men His goodness shall see. I'll sing of salvation at home and abroad. Till many shall hear the truth and trust in God. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. Our second scripture reading for today is taken from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 41 to 51. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. 
I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Next we have a couple of contemporary hymns, As the Deer and Offering. Please join in in worship as we sing it together. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. desire and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. desire and I long to worship Thee. The sun cannot compare to the glory of Your love. There is no shadow in Your presence. No mortal man dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven, it's only by your blood, and it's only through your mercy, Lord, I come, I bring an offering of worship to the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. Okay, kids, it's your part of the service, so I hope you're ready to sing. Let's all sing together, Lord, I lift your name on high. After the song, Diane will tell you a story.
Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Thank you, Andrew and Sylvie. Good morning, children. I have been thinking a lot about fruit. Can you list some fruit with me? Apples, grapes, pineapple, kiwi, oranges, pears, mangoes, avocados, watermelon, strawberries, and so many more. The reason I was thinking about fruit was that I was eating a really sweet cantaloupe and was struck with how very different each fruit tastes and what variety we have. God is so good to not only provide us with good food, but such variety and flavors. How kind to make our food so tasty and our world so beautiful. Our song today said that we love to sing God's praises. That means we love to sing about how good and kind and wonderful God is. He came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. That is the story of Jesus coming from heaven to be born as a baby, growing up and dying on the cross to take away our sins, and then being raised up to life again. So much to think about. Jesus left heaven. Jesus lived here and loved and healed many people. He did many miracles and also taught people how to live their lives. He died, and then he was raised from the dead, and after visiting with his disciples, Jesus went up back into heaven. He is there, loving us and helping us through the Holy Spirit to follow him. Did you take the time to say good morning to Jesus when you got up? And did you thank him for all he does for us? Let's try to notice all the wonderful variety in our world and to say thank you for this. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for each of these children and for their parents and families. We are all your children, and we ask that you would help us to notice and say thank you for all the variety in our world. Summertime, we have so much fresh food to eat and such lovely flowers to look at. Please help us to notice and then to say thanks. We want to remember where everything comes from. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Andrew, Sylvie, and Diane. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, you are the Almighty God. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the one who has made us. We approach you confident in your love for us. We approach you because of Jesus, because he died on the cross for us, because he paid for our sins, because the curtain in the temple was torn, showing that he opened the way into your presence. And yet we come knowing that what we have done and said and thought has often displeased you, knowing that we need your forgiveness again. We ask your forgiveness in Jesus' name. Thank you that when we come in repentance, you restore our relationship with yourself. Father, many of us have friends and family members who are not walking with you. Some have never shown any interest in spiritual things. Others have shown an interest and then wandered off. 
Still others have professed faith in you, but now they show no interest in you, in your word, or in your people. We pray for each of them. We ask that you would again do something in their lives to get their attention and to draw them to Jesus. Thank you for those of our congregation who have been experiencing better health. We pray for those with ongoing problems, with chronic pain. We pray for those needing surgery or other medical help. We pray for those who need help within their hearts and minds. Emotional help. Spiritual help. Strength for the difficulties and problems they face on a weekly or daily basis. Father, we pray for those in need, perhaps financial need, perhaps in need of food, perhaps in need of work. We pray for those having struggles in relationships with a friend or a spouse or other family members, with a boss or a co-worker. We ask that you would grant them peace within and without. Now we ask that you would continue your presence with us by your Spirit as we look into your word written by John. We ask that you would instruct us. Help us to remember what we learn and especially those things we need now and for the coming days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus had been teaching the crowd. He knew they were only interested in following him because of the free food. Among the spiritual lessons he had been trying to teach them about himself, when talking with them, was that he was the bread that came down from heaven. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Some of the Jews, that is to say the religious leaders among the people, had been listening to Jesus' conversation with the crowd. They were very unhappy with Jesus' description of himself as the bread that came down from heaven. Although there was something mysterious about Jesus' description of himself as bread, that wasn't what really troubled them at this time. What troubled them was when he said he came down from heaven. Like the religious leaders in Jerusalem, they found this offensive. They knew that Jesus meant that he was sent from God. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. Capernaum wasn't very far from Nazareth, where Jesus was raised. The religious leaders knew or at least they thought they knew, that Jesus was the son of Joseph and Mary of Nazareth. So how could he say that he came down from heaven? I think they meant their question as a rhetorical question. Some of them had probably seen Jesus as a boy in Nazareth. They were sure that they knew exactly where Jesus came from. However, in asking their question, they were factually incorrect. They were right in thinking that they knew his mother, Jesus was the son of Mary. But Jesus wasn't the son of Joseph. He had no earthly father. Jesus was raised by Joseph, but Jesus was not the son of Joseph. As it happens, their question raised a serious issue. Who is Jesus? What is his nature? Is he human, or is he divine? Is he the son of man, or is he the son of God? This question was one of the first major doctrinal issues the early church had to deal with after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. Many of the cults that pretend to be Christian have fallen into error on this very point. Some have denied his humanity, emphasizing the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. And he definitely was the Son of God, meaning that he was God. This is stressed repeatedly throughout the New Testament. Some have denied his divinity, emphasizing the fact that Jesus was the Son of Man. And he definitely was the Son of Man, meaning that he was human. Jesus described himself this way consistently in the Gospels. This is where human understanding runs into problems. Human reasoning says that Jesus must be one or the other. However, the writers of the New Testament, the Apostles, and Jesus himself said that he was both human and divine the Son of Man, and the Son of God. We don't have to understand how that is possible, but we do have to accept it 
to truly understand the Jesus whom we worship and serve. The religious leaders at Capernaum saw Jesus in the flesh. They thought they knew Jesus' ancestry and his origins. They didn't question his humanity at all. From their point of view, that's all he was, just another man. Like the religious leaders in Jerusalem, they assumed that Jesus could not possibly be the Son of God. That assumption was wrong. Jesus was, and is, both the Son of God and the Son of Man. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Once again, Jesus didn't answer their objection. He didn't argue for the fact that he is the Son of God from heaven. Instead, he assumed it to be true, describing God as the Father who sent me, and then dealt with the heart of their problem. Although they were face to face with Jesus, these religious leaders had not come to Jesus in the sense of becoming his disciples. For example, we've just seen that they didn't believe that Jesus was sent from God. Jesus made a general statement. People cannot come to him unless God draws them. Jesus didn't just randomly choose to tell them this particular spiritual truth. He chose to tell them this for a reason. Jesus was about to explain to them why they hadn't come to him as followers. He was about to explain to them why they hadn't believed in him. Last week I spoke of the larger group of God's chosen people, Israel, and of the smaller group among them who actually believed. Everyone that Jesus was speaking to that day were among the chosen people. The crowd were all Jews. The disciples were all Jews. The religious leaders were the ones that John repeatedly refers to as the Jews. Everyone listening that day was part of the larger group, part of God's chosen people. But the disciples were in the smaller group, those who believed in Jesus. The Father was drawing them all to Jesus. That was the only way that anyone could come to Jesus. He was drawing everyone among God's people. That included those in the smaller group of believers. How was he drawing them? Quoting from Isaiah 54, Jesus explained that they were all taught by God. The nation of Israel had the writings of God's servants, Moses, and the prophets, which taught them. This is how God had been drawing them. And God had continued to draw them. He used the miracles as signs to get their attention. And then Jesus, the greatest teacher ever, had taught them about himself, showing them how he fulfilled the scriptures. But the basis of God's drawing of them was the teaching of the Old Testament scriptures. Those who believed were also taught, of course, along with the entire nation of Israel. But it's not enough to be taught. We were all once students. We know that it's not enough to be taught. Students have to listen and learn. It's not enough to be taught the Scripture. We have to listen and learn from Scripture. If we hear something and ignore it or dismiss it, it doesn't do us any good. This smaller group had not only been taught by God, they had also heard and learned from what they were taught. Because they heard what God the Father taught and then learned from him, they came to Jesus and believed in him. Jesus would raise from death those who did come. He would raise them on the last day. They would have eternal life. The religious leaders, if they had actually learned from God's teaching in Scripture, could have come to Jesus. But they hadn't really listened to the Father and they hadn't learned from him. So they refused to be drawn by the Father, they were not drawn by the Father, and therefore they couldn't come to Jesus. It's a misunderstanding to think that we just come to God on our own. We can't and don't. We don't just wake up one morning thinking to ourselves, this is the morning I'm going to believe. Rather, God draws us. That's why we dare not postpone the decision to follow Jesus. We cannot just assume that we will hear and believe another time. For one thing, we are not guaranteed more time. Worse, each time we resist God's drawing, we find it easier to resist the next time. I wonder how you picture God's drawing. We have a calico cat. 
Most of you know that cats are independent creatures. They do what they want. I was a boy when I first learned how to get a cat to come to me. First, I had to get the cat's attention. I might make an intriguing sound, a scratching sound, for example. Then I would continue scratching, under a blanket, perhaps, so that the cat could see and hear random movement. Usually the cat would come closer to investigate, and maybe even pounce on my hand under the blanket. Then I could either continue the game or pet the cat. At any time the cat could turn away and ignore me. It might be sleepy or uninterested. The same is true for us. We can turn away from God, we can ignore Him, and show our disinterest in spiritual things. Too often we do. It's a misunderstanding to think that one day God just drags us into the kingdom of Jesus, like a person might snap a collar on a cat and drag it with a leash. That's not how the Father draws us. The Father draws us gently. As we turn toward His Word, He draws us to His Son Jesus. God doesn't draw each of us in exactly the same way. Sometimes God gets our attention through joy, such as at the birth of a child, sometimes through tragedy, such as at the death of a loved one, perhaps through fear or through delight in God's creation. And He uses people or events in our lives, sometimes long before we hear His Word. Too many people have had moments in their lives when God has gotten their attention, but when the moment passed they've dismissed it, ignored it, and otherwise refused to let God draw them to Jesus. Eventually, if we will let Him, He will direct us to His Word to learn about Him and about His Son Jesus Christ. He will show His love for us in Jesus. If we come to Him, He will live within us by His Holy Spirit. In the case of the religious leaders, they were familiar with God's Word because they'd been taught it. But they had a responsibility to hear and to learn. Instead, they ignored His Word. And so when they met Jesus, they even questioned whether God had sent Him. They had God's Word, which was meant to draw them to Jesus, but they did not learn from the Word, and they would not come to Jesus. Those who are drawn are taught by God, they hear and learn from the Father, and are drawn to Jesus. We have, at this moment, the Word of God in front of us. Let's allow God to draw us closer to Himself. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Jesus seems to have been digressing, but he wasn't. They hadn't seen the Father, but they'd had the Word of God, the Old Testament. They'd had Moses and the prophets. They should have known what God taught. No one had seen God except Jesus. That was the point. Now they did see Jesus, sent from God, standing in front of them, teaching them. They were looking at the one from heaven, the only one who truly knew and understood spiritual things. Then Jesus went back to his main theme, believing. The Father draws people in order that they might believe. In this case, believing that Jesus was sent by God from heaven. And it is those who believe who have eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. Although the manna did come down from heaven, it only provided physical sustenance. It wasn't the kind of bread that makes possible eternal life. It is Jesus himself who is the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus told them again that he is the living bread. This reminds us of what he said to the woman at the well when he described himself as the living water. This living bread is for the life of the world. This gospel would not be limited to just God's chosen people. It would be for everyone. Jesus describes his flesh, his physical body, as what he would give for anyone to eat. What did he mean? The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The Jews, meaning the religious leaders, were puzzled. They weren't sure what Jesus meant. How could he literally give them his flesh? In Mark 4, Jesus told his disciples that he spoke in parables to conceal the truth from those who didn't believe. In John 16, Jesus said that he sometimes spoke in figures of speech to the disciples. Later, when they were ready, he told them plainly. Eventually, the disciples would know what Jesus meant. Eventually, they would realize that he actually did give his flesh when he died on the cross. Jesus' death on the cross is our source of life. But for now, Jesus meant this to be a puzzle to these unbelieving religious leaders whose main interest in speaking with him was to challenge him, or criticize him, or accuse him. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Steve Gregg commented that it seems that Jesus was deliberately being provocative. Taken literally, this would be cannibalism. Worse, the people of Israel were absolutely forbidden to drink even an animal's blood. We know that Jesus didn't mean it literally, but it is still a very hard saying. This is one of those scriptures where words are plain, but the meaning is not. The first thing that Jesus is saying goes back to the picture of himself as the bread of life. He himself, Jesus, is the source of spiritual life, of eternal life. Paul describes it as Jesus being in us, or as we being in Jesus. Both of these describe a close relationship, so close that Jesus' spiritual life is shared with us. His righteousness is given to us, and he takes our sin upon himself. Second, eating meat brings life to those who eat it, but it comes at the cost of death to the animal. Just as eating the flesh of an animal means the death of the animal, so spiritual life from Jesus comes at a cost, his death. It's for this reason that Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table, at which we partake of food and drink, to remind ourselves of Jesus' body or flesh and his blood. We do so because without his death, we would not have spiritual life. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Here Jesus summed up what he was teaching by first introducing a new thought. The Son gets his life from the Father, and we get our life from the Son. Then he went on to repeat what he had said already. By the way, let's assume that if something is repeated in Scripture, it is probably important. Not only did Jesus choose to repeat himself, John included this repetition in his Gospel. Whoever feeds on Jesus, the living bread, will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Jesus' disciples, those who followed him, at this time included more than the twelve. This larger number are the ones referred to here. They found Jesus' words hard or offensive. After all, even if we don't take what he said literally, it can still make us feel almost sick. So why did Jesus speak in this way? Steve Gregg thinks that Jesus was deliberately discouraging the disciples, that he only wanted disciples who didn't think that serving him was optional. We know there are those who don't want to serve a God who is demanding. They like their religion to be gentle and positive at all times. They fall away during the tough times, because they are not fully committed to Jesus. Jesus' response was in the form of a question. 
then what if you were to see this? What if you were to see me ascending back to heaven? I think that Jesus was talking about confirmation of the truth of what he was saying. He had been saying that spiritual life, eternal life, was to be found in him. He was saying that he'd been sent from God, from heaven. So if they saw him ascending back into heaven, it would be proof that he was speaking the truth. We know that in Acts chapter 1, the 11, Judas no longer being with them, would see Jesus ascending back to heaven. That would confirm the truth of all that he had said. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus had been talking in pictures about his own flesh being what they needed for spiritual life. Then he switched to speaking of the flesh in the more usual sense. Our flesh is useless toward gaining spiritual life. In fact, it is worse than than useless. So often it pulls us away from spiritual things. So often the sins we do have their origin in the desires of the flesh. They pull us away from the eternal life that Jesus is offering. Eternal life is spiritual. Eternal life is from the Spirit of God. We must turn away from the flesh with its desires and turn to the words of Jesus. That is the way to eternal life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Jesus was aware that among the larger number of his disciples, those who followed him, there was unbelief, serious unbelief. And even one of the twelve was an unbeliever to the point that he would be willing later to betray Jesus. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. We noticed last week that the ones the Father had given or granted to Jesus were Jews who were already believers in what God had said in Old Testament Scripture. They already expected and desired the coming Messiah. But there were others, even many in Jesus' entourage, who didn't really believe. They were unbelievers in what God had foretold in Scripture and in what he did through Jesus. They didn't believe he was the Messiah King who deserved their undying loyalty. Therefore the Father had not granted them to come to Jesus, though they were part of God's chosen people, and even following with Jesus. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter was speaking for himself and the rest of the twelve. As hard or offensive as Jesus' sayings were, they knew they were hearing words of eternal life. They believed that Jesus was God's Holy One, his Messiah. They believed it and remained loyal and dedicated to his service, all but one. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Judas was going about with Jesus and the other disciples. Anyone looking on would have thought that he was truly a follower of Jesus. As I said last week, It's never been the case that God chooses some people and that every one of those chosen gets eternal life. If that were true, then Judas, chosen by Jesus himself, would get eternal life. Instead, it is those who believe who have eternal life. Let's close by looking back at Peter's words in verse 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. This is one of those times when impetuous Peter was exactly right. He knew, what we all must understand, that there is no other person to turn to. Jesus has the words of eternal life. Peter's question was rhetorical. To whom shall we go? What about us? Do we want to understand why we exist? Do we want to understand spiritual truth? Then we must go to Jesus. Do we want to be saved from the sin that clings to us? 
Do we want forgiveness of sins? Do we want eternal life? Then we must go to Jesus. Peter asked, To whom shall we go? Then he answered his own question. Jesus has the words of eternal life. Let us pray. Father, you know who is listening today. Perhaps someone who is still confused about life's purpose. May he or she turn to your son Jesus. Perhaps someone who has once made a commitment, but who is caught up in sin or in the things of this world. May he or she return to your son Jesus. May we all look to Jesus for that life now, through your Spirit, and in eternity. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our closing hymn is Wonderful Words of Life. Thanks for joining us today. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.